Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing to see so many people still here in the late hours of the last afternoon of the last day in this really hot weather. So it's, uh, it's quite an honor to be speaking to you now. Um, I'd like to speak to you about biodiversity, which is something very close to my heart, and um, it's something that I've worked on for many years with farmers. Um, the first question I'd like to ask, or I'd like to invite you to, to think about, is what do we mean by biodiversity? What is biodiversity? Uh, governments and scientists often speak about genetic resources, and it's a term that many of us uh, reject because the term resource makes it seem like something to be exploited uh, for gain, for profit. Um, so we don't use that term, we use the term biodiversity. And for, for many of us, it's a, it's a wonderful term. It means um, uh, the amazing diversity of life that's on, that's on Earth. Uh, but recently, um, a group of us got together to, to actually elaborate a report on biodiversity, agricultural biodiversity. And we, we thought, OK, let's start by asking ourselves, what do we really mean by biodiversity? Because even this term of biodiversity is a relatively recent term, and it's invented by scientists, by logical diversity. When you, maybe it's um, quite common in Latin languages and in English, but when you try to translate it into other languages, it doesn't fit very well. So it, it is a kind of a foreign term, even though we like it, it's a bit foreign. So we thought that we would start by asking ourselves, what do we really mean? Without using the term, let's not use the term, what are we talking about? Um, and here, when we had this discussion, there's no translation for Italian. Okay, I'm stopping for a minute. Okay, abbiate pazienza, risolviamo subito. Fatemi un cenno. Okay. Does it work now, the Italian? Can somebody? Yes, it works. Okay. Okay, so uh, what do we mean by biodiversity? And we had this conversation with, uh, with farmers, with fisher folk, with pastoralists who are gathered together in an international platform for food sovereignty, the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty. And what we started to say was that when we talk about biodiversity, we, 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 we don't only talk about seeds, that's the first thing, because often people just think about seeds. We're not just talking about seeds, we're talking also about livestock, traditional breeds of livestock, we're talking about the pollinators, the bees, the soil biodiversity, all of these things. But essentially what we're talking about is all of life, all of living things. Um, this, this is what biodiversity is for us. Uh, but when you talk about life, it's not that human beings are outside of this biodiversity. When you define it as what's living, then we're inside this web of life. Whereas often when scientists and governments talk about biodiversity or genetic resources, it's something that's outside of human beings. We're outside of it. But in fact, we see ourselves very much as an integral part of biodiversity. And the biodiversity that exists in the world that we use to feed ourselves is really uh, a result of the interaction of human beings and the rest of living beings, no? the interaction of all of us together as we try to fulfill our human needs. And these needs are of course not only about filling our stomachs, but they are also about um, not only that, but nutrition, um, building materials. So much of biodiversity is for, for our housing um, in traditional societies, also for culture, um, also for cultural identity, for our rituals, for our pleasure, for taste, um, for religious uh, rituals. It's all of these things. So in fact, the reason why so much biodiversity exists in the world is because of this interplay between human beings, which are very diverse. There's an interplay between cultural diversity and biological diversity. Each community has its own, not only ecosystem, but also its own cultural preferences as to what it prefers in terms of colors, textures, tastes. That's why we have 
thousands of varieties of wheat, thousands of varieties of rice, hundreds of uh, breeds of, of camels and cows and sheep. It's really this, this relationship between human beings and the rest of life which has created this wonderful diversity. It's also about knowledge. The biodiversity is very much about knowledge. Without the collective knowledge of peasants, fisher folks, pastoralists, this biodiversity wouldn't exist because it's through this interplay, it's through this interaction that it has come to exist. And it's important to underline that this knowledge is collective knowledge. You cannot show me one single variety of, of any plant or a single breed of any animal which is the result of an individual's uh, intellectual and, and, and labor uh, input. It's always a collective work, always. Um, even if there are, of course, in every community, people who are a bit more interested in that and give more time to that and are recognized as being experts of that. But it's impossible to come up with a new variety or to sustain a breed of livestock without cooperation between many, many people. So this knowledge is collective. And in order to um, sustain this biodiversity, we also have to um, guard, safeguard this collective knowledge. So um, I, heard, um, I heard an interesting thing um, about uh, knowledge and science uh, from Yanda. We were speaking at lunch, and you were saying that science uh, not only uh, has created knowledge, but it's also created ignorance um, in the sense that when scientists uh, started to get involved in breeding, they told farmers and pastoralists and so on that they knew nothing, that they were ignorant. They replaced the varieties, the seeds, the livestock of farmers with their own high-tech varieties. And in that way, many farmers have started to lose that knowledge. And that's a kind of an ignorance, if you like. Not only the scientists are ignorant of the knowledge of peasants, but also peasants themselves are losing this collective knowledge. Uh, and this is something that really is important. I'll speak more uh, about that. The, the really important thing about this collective knowledge is that it, it allows peasants to be autonomous. When you have to buy every single input and you, you've lost your knowledge, the, 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 the technology does everything for you. Uh, a scientist in the lab thought about everything that needs to be done and you don't really need to know how to save your seeds, you don't need to know anymore how to select your seeds, then you lose your autonomy. Every year you have to go back to the merchants and buy those seeds or buy the fertilizers and so on. So the question of knowledge is really a question of autonomy. Um, lastly, just in, in terms of thinking what biodiversity means, I think when we are talking about reclaiming or saving our biodiversity, when we see biodiversity in this more holistic um, perspective of, of interacting with nature to meet all of our human needs, we recognize that our needs are not just to fill the stomach. We also have the needs, the cultural needs, the social and spiritual needs. And therefore, when we are saving our varieties, when we're defending them and getting them back and using them, we are not only saving, if you like, biodiversity, but we are also somehow saving a part of ourselves, a part of what it means to be human. We are not just consumers. We have other needs. We have the need for, for culture, for pleasure, for beauty. We have these needs and these are rights. And so what it means to be human is also expanded when you take this more expanded view of biodiversity. And the reason why I've taken so long to elaborate um, this question of what biodiversity really means is that I think that it has consequences for us when we think of how we think of something has consequences for how we defend it. Um, in that sense, if we see it in a more holistic way, then, for example, um, in Europe now you can go into supermarkets and you can see next to the the industrial varieties of tomatoes. You can see uh, maybe one or two land race uh, heirloom varieties, as the Americans call them. So the, the more traditional varieties are there. Um, does that mean that we've really achieved our objective, that there's these few varieties now in the supermarkets? Is that what biodiversity is? Is it just simply these sing single 
varieties, get, getting a few more on our plates and in the supermarkets? I think not. I think when we take this more expanded view of what biodiversity is, we see that it's about relationships, the relationships between human beings and the rest of the web of life, but also relationships between human beings, human communities together, the collective knowledge that I was speaking about. Um, and so I think it is important to ask ourselves, what is biodiversity, why is it significant? And to open up this conversation, not just assuming that it's more or less what the scientists say it is. It's not a list of varieties. Um, in terms of um, the challenges that we face, in terms of the challenges that we, that we face for, for saving uh, this biodiversity, you all know, and I think I won't go into a very long discussion about the technologies that are, um, that are uh, obstructing farmers from, from really controlling their own seeds and animal breeds. These are things like hybrid seeds, um, GMOs. Again, it's a question of losing autonomy through these technologies. Uh, but not only technologies, but also laws. We are in a period where seed laws throughout the world are becoming more and more strict, more and more offensive. Um, and uh, I speak about things like patents, but also plant breeders' rights. Uh, these laws are being pushed heavily, in, especially in Africa in this moment, when so many powers are interested in expanding agriculture in Africa. Um, I'm not going to go into a long list of all of these different laws. I'd just like to point you to this, um, to this excellent report by Via Campesina, which just came out, which is called Seed Laws That Criminalize Farmers. And here you will find a lot of examples of exactly what kinds of laws are being used in different parts of the world, how they're being imposed on our, on our countries, and what peasants are doing to fight back on those. And this is available on the internet in several languages. Uh, but in particular, I'd like to talk about one specific uh, technology and, and system of laws which is coming up, which I think many people don't know about, which is really, really dangerous. And this is something that we are facing in one of the, the policy spaces that some of us are engaged in to defend our seeds. And this is the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources. Some people call it the Seed Treaty, just to make it a bit short. Uh, many of our governments, more than 100 governments, have signed um, this treaty, and this treaty uh, underlines the importance of respecting farmers' rights. What are farmers' rights? Farmers have the right to use, to save, to exchange, and to sell their seeds. Uh, these are really a, an important package together, and of course, as I mentioned, can't speak about the material aspect of biodiversity seeds without speaking about the knowledge and all of the social relationships that go around it. So this is also part of farmers' rights, the right to maintain your knowledge. For us, this is a, a, a really important struggle to defend these rights, to enact laws in our countries that respect farmers' rights. And this is being um, heavily eroded. This year in particular, we're going to have a huge struggle in, in the meeting of the Sea Treaty. It will take place in October in, uh, in Rome, in FAO. Um, and here there's, there's talk of a, a new kind of technology and a new legal um, instrument. Now, I mean, normally when we speak about patents, we speak about patents on a single variety. But what what the seed corporations are pushing for now is patents on sequences of genes, no? So they use their technology to, to do the gene sequencing of, of a number of varieties. With new technologies, this is very cheap. You just put the seeds, uh, I don't know exactly how it works, but you put the seeds in some kind of machine and it gives you the gene sequence. And with these gene sequences, they're, they're trying to identify specific sequences that supposedly control specific traits. Traits like uh, resistance to salinity, for example. And they're patenting this sequence of genes. What does that mean? They're not patenting anymore necessarily the entire seed, a, a particular variety, but this particular sequence. When you have a patent on a sequence, it means that Wherever in nature, wherever in nature that sequence appears, the, co the co company who's patented that sequence can claim that 
it's theirs, no? So even if a company has never, let's say that a, a variety in your field, a peasant variety somewhere in, in, in the heart of Asia or Africa has a particular sequence in it, this is an indigenous uh, variety, if they can get their hands on that variety, do the gene sequencing, and find that sequence that they've already patented, they can catch you for using what they've patented. They can ask you to pay for it. They can criminalize you for using it without patenting it. And I know it sounds absurd, but believe me, it's true. And what the, um, what the, gov what the companies are now pushing governments to do in the C treaty is to actually fund and have a system, a huge database, which, which, can, which contains all the genetic sequences of all of the seeds in the national and public gene banks. And not even that, to continue to do, uh, to do collection missions in peasant farms throughout the world and to sequence all of those. No? So, so the frontier of patents is, is coming. It's, it's, it's really a very, very, very strong attack, and this is why we have to mobilize very, very, very strongly against this, and to make sure that, that the seeds that are in the, the public gene banks and the seeds that are in farmers' fields are not sequenced and put into these databases, which can just be searched through the internet, no? And, well, they have your, page, they have your sequence, then they have your seed. Um, I'd like to talk also about um, the importance of knowledge, as I've also already mentioned. I think it's really important to underline that knowledge and research is part of the peasant tradition. Peasants have knowledge, pastoralists also, fisher folk. And they've always been involved in research. Every single peasant, true peasant who's not using high tech, is a researcher. Often the um, the, uh, I think a myth exists that when you speak about peasant varieties or indigenous varieties, then you're speaking of something which, which is uh, not changing, no? which is something like a museum piece, no? an old variety. This is not the case. Research has always been an ongoing thing in, in peasant cultures. There's always an active engagement every single year to select new varieties. So knowledge is really at the heart of peasant practices. And we have to show that this knowledge is still alive, in many places is being recovered, and we have to connect the different experiences that we have because there's so much that we can learn from each other, especially in a time of climate change, especially because, I mean, I, I really see it as a kind of an emergency situation. We have to exchange our seeds and knowledge because the varieties that were adapted to Italy 50 years ago might not be adapted anymore. The, the, the research aspect of biodiversity is really a high, high priority. And we need, we need public researchers to work with us. It's really a challenge. Any of you who have worked with public researchers as I have know that the researchers who work with us are often marginalized in their own institutions. They're not funded. Um, they face all sorts of problems, but they still do work with us. So we have a peasant knowledge, but we also are open to working with researchers who respect that knowledge uh, and who are open to working with participatory methodologies. We have to show that even though we're open to having this collaboration with public researchers, we're not waiting for them to start working with us. We are continuing an ancient tradition of research of creating knowledge together. And this is something that needs to be uh, strengthened, as I said, through, um, through many, 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 many kinds of exchanges. Um, at this time, uh, yes, at this time, when these seed laws are being pushed so strongly on us, it's really important to be able to act in a unified way together. Um, and in many ways, our analysis inside uh, the food sovereignty movement or um, uh, other movements that you might feel yourself a part of, many times we are united. Our analysis is very similar. Uh, we're against GMOs, we're against uh, restrictive seed laws. We, we, we're, we're quite united on what's wrong with the system. But in certain cases, especially on the issue of, um, of biodiversity, there are differences also in, in terms of what we see as the solution. And I think that 
since we're under such pressure now, it's really urgent to, to recognize that these differences exist between us. There are differences of opinion on certain things. Um, I can mention two of the ones which I think are, um, are really important. Um, one is that there are those who think that in order to defend um, peasant varieties, we need laws, but we need other laws. We need regulations. We need to have a system of governance which, which, um, which protects these seeds. And there are others who say that every single law is corrupted and useless and can be used against us. And in fact, we've never had, we've never had the state, the central state or international institutions governing peasant varieties, and so we don't need seed laws. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to solve this controversy now, but uh, it's just to say that this exists and it makes it difficult to move forward together on a unified strategy. Uh, I don't think that we should uh, impose one side over the other, but I think that we should create more and more spaces to discuss these issues in a, in a is as constructive way as possible, because when the attack is so, so strong, you, you can't afford to be divided, although it might take a lot of time to, to, to reach some kind of consensus. The other thing that is quite a controversy in the world of biodiversity within our movements is the question of whether uh, seeds and biodiversity, I mean, everyone is, is agreed that we don't want intellectual property rights, that uh, they, we don't want patents. But then what do we want? Again, there's a kind of a divergence. And here there are those who say that there should be absolutely no claim of, um, of ownership or um, belonging of any variety to anyone. So seeds basically should be the common heritage of humanity. So basically, totally open, open access for everyone. And there are those that say, no, we don't want intellectual property rights. But it's, it's not true to say that each seed equally belongs to all of us. Because as I've said, each variety is the result of a process of collective knowledge building. And each variety is linked to a particular territory, a particular culture, uh, a particular cosmovision, if you like. And so it's not possible to just say all seeds belong to everyone equally. Uh, this country uh, has done one of the most amazing things to defend this system. You have regional seed laws in Italy on collective rights that recognize the rights of particular communities to the varieties that they have created. Uh, and this is a really good example of the other system. No, So it's not a free and open access to everyone. It's not the same as intellectual property rights. Uh, it's not a monopoly privilege, these collective rights. But it does say that we need to recognize the investment that was made by a specific community. These, uh, these divergences, I think we need to discuss them more and more. Because in certain, on certain issues, we're, we're not able to move forward together. And I think it's quite urgent to, to open up spaces to, to discuss these. And I'd like to, um, to end on a more positive note, maybe, um, which is that one of the challenges that we face in the world of organizing around biodiversity is that the world of people who work on seeds is really dominant, let's admit it. Um, uh, there's very little discussion um, on livestock, on aquatic genetic resources, let alone on soil biodiversity and on pollinators and all of these other things. And yet we can we claim that we, we always have a holistic view. And it's so difficult to bring together herders with farmers, with fisher folks, to talk about biodiversity all together and to work all together. Because the, the, I, think, I think it's not that we, I think it's not our problem, but it's a problem that has been imposed on us in the sense that it, on the level of the territory, every peasant has a few plants, maybe a few chickens, uh, a few fruit trees. At the level of the territory, we have this integration. But uh, I'm just about to finish. But at the level of uh, institutions, laws, uh, universities, everything is fragmented. You either are a plant breeder or you're a livestock breeder or you're something else. So this fragmentation, I think, has been imposed on us and we have to reject it. 
there's, it's, it's not possible. If we claim that we have this holistic view and everything is interconnected in the web of life, we have to be coherent. And in that sense, I think that one of the most positive things that's come out is the declaration of the forum in Mali, the forum on agroecology, which took place in February. The, the most significant thing about this forum was that it came out with a new and expanded version of agroecology, which includes pastoralists, fisher folk, et cetera, et cetera. Even though when we first invited them to the forum, they said agroecology, it has nothing to do with us. The word agro, it means it's for peasants, it's about crops, it's about soil. Um, and we said, no, 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 come and let's discuss. Let's discuss because we, need, we know we need alliances. We know we need to, to create linkages between the different movements. And so we said, let's discuss what's at the heart of agroecology. It's not only about uh, crops. I'm very sorry. Uh, <laughs> once you get something that's really interesting to you. Um, it's not only about crops, but it's about a way of interacting with nature to produce the food that you need. And therefore, in that way, we were able to see uh, pastoralism, fishing, etc., etc., in this new expanded definition of agroecology. And I think that that will allow us to have an expanded view of biodiversity, which is really, really important as well. So I'm very sorry to take up so much of your time. Thank you. Thank you.